Well, I don't know what you were planning to do on this day, but I know that what I'm doing is different than what I was planning to do. I had hoped to be back with my friends in classes and to be looking towards the end of semester and the celebrations that all of that brought. And instead, I'm sitting here in my granddaughter's bedroom when she comes to visit, and I'm um, making this video that I hope might be helpful to some of you as you kind of process maybe through how you're feeling, how you're processing and dealing with this season of um, disorientation, of loss, of um, trying to figure out what is, uh, what is going on and all of the plans that you had made for the last few weeks of school and then heading into the summer, completely disrupted and upended and still trying to figure out where the bottom is. And it's to that that I'd like to maybe speak for a few minutes um, in this less than formal way, um, in a way that I hope will be somewhat helpful. Um, the passage that I always go to for stuff like this in the Bible is Psalm 23. You're familiar with it, I'm sure, but um, I'd like to read it with you and then just talk about the journey that it invites us on and that, in fact, we are on, uh, whether consciously or not. It says this, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't be afraid because you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I don't intend to kind of walk through this psalm verse by verse, although it'd be worth doing there, but I want you to notice how this psalm addresses what I think is the common reality of our lives, but that we often miss. And that is that we are constantly in transition. We are constantly on the move. So even though it begins with a general statement of orientation, green pastures, still waters, it, and a refreshing of soul, it becomes quickly clear that that is about preparing us for the next thing where he leads us in paths of righteousness and right ways to live for his name's sake. Um, and the point, of course, is that orientation always sets us up for this disorientation, this place where things are, are not what we had planned, not what we had hoped, not what we had expected they would be. These valleys of the shadow of death, of loss, of grief, of mourning. And in there, the psalmist is very aware, there, there are dragons that live in that valley. There are things that would want to take us captive and undermine our faith and our walking with God. But he says, I'm not going to be afraid of that because I've got this awareness of your presence. And you'll notice that the pronoun of the psalm changes. In the beginning, it's the Lord is my shepherd, a general testimony of God's presence and faithfulness. But then as we get into that place of the, of the rubber hitting the road, the nitty gritty of life, he says, you are with me. So it changes to accompanied presence. It's not something now I'm talking about as in memory. It is a, a, an immediate awareness. You're with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. The rod being that 
that four foot long knob on the top stick that the shepherd uses to protect the sheep from uh, marauding animals, that staff that has that crook in it, the traditional shepherd staff that pulls the sheep back into the path when they've wandered off or gotten stuck in some uh, ditch someplace. Um, so he says, I'm not going to be afraid because you protect me, you defend me, but you also correct me. You bring me back into the center when I need it. So here's this time of disorientation that gets us to places that teaches us things that orientation wouldn't have taught us. Green pastures, uh, still waters don't equip us for the life that we're actually built to live. Because the truth of the matter is we're built for journey. We're not built for place. We're built for going. Ever since Genesis 2, when we lost our place, Genesis 3, when we lost our place in the garden, we have been longing for home. We have been on a journey home since that time. And so we are invited into this psalm where he just says, we, we are on journey. You prepare us. You orient us but then there is disorientation. And this is too then the path of righteousness for your name's sake. And along the way, we discover the metaphor changes and we see a table spread and a generous host with a cup poured, overflowing with blessing, a head anointed of presence and hospitality and welcome. Uh, right here in the middle of chaos, in the middle of confusion, in the middle of disorientation, we find a place of reorientation, uh, a place where we are reminded that God is with us. And as a result of that, he says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Why? Because wherever I am, the Lord is with me. And that then becomes his house. Surely, he says, goodness and mercy will chase after me. It's a strong verb in the Hebrew, will chase after me all the days of my life, making every place that I am the dwelling place of God, of the house of the Lord. So part of what I wanted to just underline very quickly here uh, in this season of grief and loss and, and mourning, uh, the, the hopes that we had had for commencement, the hopes that we had had to, uh, for, for missions trips, the hopes that we had held, had for study abroad, the hopes that we had had for uh, summer internships and jobs that now seem to be everything's up in, 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 in chaos and in disarray and disorientation. And this psalmist wants to remind us, and maybe if I can, if I can remind us all as well, you as well as me, that um, we're not alone in this. Uh, we can testify to the Lord as our shepherd, but when we're in the midst of the mess, you are with me. So I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to walk in, in, in fear that grips and paralyzes. I might be afraid, but I'm going to continue to move forward in courage. Uh, and, and, and I think that that underlines the fact that transitions are, are inevitable. There is no there at which we ever arrive. So we get to that place where a table is spread and a host has poured us a cup and our heads are anointed. And soon that becomes the new orientation that gets disoriented down the line. All of you have lived long enough. I'm sure, as I have, to have already begun to experience the fact that there is no there there. If I can just get to, then when you get there, you discover you haven't really arrived at any place in particular. It's just a, a station stop on the journey, and away we go into the next adventure uh, until finally uh, we are home. Um, so what that means is, I guess we need to get used to living life as it is, not as we wished it would have been. Uh, somebody said once that life is what happens when you were planning something else. Uh, we get, need to get used to then living in this life. This is why Jesus says, don't, don't, don't worry about tomorrow. Um, it, it's, it's got enough trouble for its own. Be present in the day. This is where God is. This is that good shepherd present with us in the middle of this. So 
we, we grieve the life that we have expected and hoped for, planned for, dreamed of, that isn't now real. Um, we grieve that. That's what grief is for. Uh, mourning is that gift that God gives us to enable us to honor the loss of something that was important and vital to us, whether it's a friendship or a relationship, or even more catastrophically, uh, loved ones who, who die or, or dreams that die. Grief is that broad-based muscle of emotion that enables us to process these losses in, in, in ways that are appropriate to the degree of the loss. But we don't grieve, Paul says, as if we had no hope. So love and joy, those other two kind of baseline emotions come in and help us grieve, but not as if we had no hope. We, we, we let joy give us capacity for the moments. We let joy uh, give us the ability to say, mm, this hurts, this is hard, but I'm going to hang in there. I'm going to stay engaged. I'm going to stay in the game. I'm not going to get sidelined, even though this is a catastrophic loss. This is a massive disappointment. All right, um, I'm going to let it hurt, but I'm going to I'm going to stay in the game. I'm going to not let it sideline me because here's the deal: the more energy we spend bemoaning the loss of what is now not going to be, the less capacity we have for the life that actually is, and this is the life. The one that actually is, is the life in which we will meet God. Because sometimes that desert, or that valley rather, becomes a desert. It becomes a place where the heat is turned up and the pressure is increased. And we are transformed in that crucible moment into the kinds of people who, having heard the voice from the heaven, that we, heavens, that we are the, the children of the Father in whom he is well pleased. We are his beloved. And so we press on to this um, uh, place of awareness, a place that uh, he is with us, this place that he is doing something good in this. He, is, he didn't cause this. He didn't make this happen. But now that this has happened, whatever the this is, and believe me, over the course of your lifetime, there are going to be a lot more thises that happen. And, and when they do, you don't want to miss the opportunity to be part of what God might be doing by grieving the loss of what he's not doing. You want to be where he is, not where he was, or not where you thought he was going to be. So how do we do that? The, the, the reality is this journey is more like sailing than riding a train. Uh, a, a train gets on the tracks and just goes straight down until it arrives at destination. But a sailboat says, if you will, what wind is blowing, I'm going to harness that wind to get where I'm going. I'm going to, I'm going to take advantage of whatever wind blows to accomplish the larger outcome, the larger purpose for my, for my journey. And Jesus is very clear. You don't get to choose your destination. That has been selected for you. So he says, keep your eyes on the prize. Seek first God and his kingdom. Keep uh, looking hard. And, 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 and moving towards the rule of God, the way of God, the righteousness of God. And then whatever wind blows, you'll be able to maximize that towards uh, uh, an outcome. Um, and so a couple of strategies very, very quickly to accomplish this. First of all, uh, a regular rhythm of uh, presence, of engagement, of being in and with the Lord is, is really important. If you need a devotional rhythm to help you get tracking with that. Uh, we'll upload one and you're welcome to access that. Second, remember that worship is really a critical component in this, to have a big picture of who God is, uh, a God that is big enough for the crisis of your life is really critical. And if you're struggling with worship, begin with thanksgiving, not always for all things, but at the very least in all things. And the reason is simple. None of us are smart enough to know at any given moment whether what is happening can be utilized for something else. And so we want to receive what happens 
We want to offer it up with thanksgiving and put it in the hands of one who can redeem all and everything. Then uh, the next stage for me is to rejoy. Paul uses the language of rejoicing as a regular pattern, a regular discipline. Uh, and I think what he has in mind there, because joy is kind of that, that Easter emotion that invites us into the reality of the fact that we serve a God who can raise the dead. But that means that we need to sit in the, in the pain of Thursday night's leaving, in the splash zone of Friday's dying, of all of the dreams, all of the hopes, of all of the expectations, just bleeding out in front of us. And sitting also in the bleakness of the Saturday with an uncertainty about what's coming next, if anything's coming next, and fear that, that, that can be disabling if we're not careful. But as we stay in it, if we run towards the pain rather than away from it, we discover we get bigger and we persist through till the Sunday morning uh, moment of resurrection where we're invited into a deeper awareness of life on the other side of life. Um, so rejoicing, sitting in that mystery, uh, and then that enables us increasingly to choose to walk in love, uh, to choose to continue to risk, to choose to continue to show up in our own lives, to choose to continue to be engaged and helpful with people. So that final step, we can choose to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. We are built to serve. We are built to assist. We are built to help. And as we transition through these inevitable transitions, we are invited into this shared partnership. In Mark chapter four, uh, Mark tells a story of a storm that breaks out in which uh, the disciples are afraid. Uh, Jesus stills the storm having been wakened from fear because they're afraid. He doesn't still the storm because they have faith. He stills the storm because they're afraid. He might do that in some of the situations that we're dealing with. But as we grow, as we develop, as we mature, increasingly because we know who he is, we know that he's up to great good, we will, perhaps even through the storm and in it, keep rowing, even if he chooses to sleep, even if he chooses not to intervene at any given moment. Because we know that if he is with us, even if it appears in the moment that he's asleep, we're in good hands. Let me pray for you, and then I'll get off your feet here. Father, I thank you for my friends. I pray that you would strengthen them, encourage them in this hard and difficult time in which the life that they had scheduled and planned has gone a slightly different direction than they had anticipated. I pray, Lord, that you would encourage them, that you would presence yourself with them, that you would leave fingerprints and footprints of your presence that they would be reminded regularly that you're with them and more, that you are for them in this season. I ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for the privilege of these last few minutes.